Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Amtoy Knowledge Session on Family Business Empowerment. Today, we have a very eminent speaker, a lady, Dr. Meeta Dixit. She is the co founder of Equation Advisors Private Limited. She is an advisor, researcher, and educator specialized in guiding single and multi generational family owned businesses. Dr. Meeta Dixit has over 25 years of experience in family business advisory. She mentors next generation successors, women and entrepreneurs, and startup founders. Dr. Meeta Dixit has done her PhD in Indian family business from Bits Pilani University. She is a certified family business advisor from the Family Firm Institute USA. I would also like uh, Mr. Shantanu Bhatkamkar to share why Amtoy is doing family business session and which is a multi-model association. Mr. Shantanu Bhatkamkar, please share your thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, Tarun, and welcome, Mita. I have known her for a long time, and I can promise you, you will have a wonderful session, very lively, very interactive, and very practical. And the biggest advantage is Nita comes from a business background. So it is not that it's a pure academic approach. She has practiced business. She has seen her earlier generations in business. So she gets connected with family business very intensely. In uh, the earlier session, we saw very clearly that not necessarily the Western models the Western studies apply to us and not exactly even if they apply to us. So I think now we are moving forward and we are going to see some practical steps on resilience on family front. Like business has to be resilience and we need business continuity plan and the pack has to stay together and which is always a challenge though people don't like to admit it as a challenge we have advantages as family business we have advantages as families in business as owner as management and as help or guide but it comes with bundle of expectations different goals and as much as our technical aspects financial aspects of business are important and critical in family business family issues are very critical and that famous three circle model i think is still irreplaceable and those seven types of stakeholders in the business are still relevant with this mita the floor is yours i will request all the participants to put questions in Q and A, we will have plenty of time for interaction because last session we found that we had a lot many questions and we could have given detailed answers to those questions. Please focus your questions on family business. We don't mind if you go little beyond the presentation. But the question has to be on family business. Please put a lot of questions and avoid putting that in chat. We will give first priority to people who put questions in Q&A. And you can start putting them even now. We will filter them and we will moderate them correctly for clarity. So, Mita, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. You are mute. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Badkamkar, for inviting me here. And I uh, really I am so happy to be here uh, with Amtoy members uh, in uh, in this uh, new or say post pandemic era, because we met or say I uh, did uh, some uh, sessions in Mumbai and Chennai uh, with uh, that was pre pandemic era. That was long time ago. Looks like. So things have changed in last couple of hours drastically. 
And uh, I think the family business model or family business uh, structure is also taking its own uh, uh, shape or say rather reshaping. And today I want to talk and share my experiences on uh, how the changes are happening at the family business level. What is good about, as you mentioned, about uh, uh, some Western models and uh, our Indian uh, culture or Indian philosophy. So uh, let me share some ex experiences and examples of how uh, this Western model works or does not work in Indian context. Um, uh, so great. Uh, let me uh, uh, share one um, data point with you. Uh, during pandemic, when uh, it was almost for about our uh, year, year and a half, uh, we uh, did not have, we in the sense that we consulting business was uh, almost stopped because the clients were either too busy um, managing their business, like uh, the entire logistics uh, industry was very, very active in uh, during these times, pharmaceutical industry and uh, essential goods, they were very active and the businesses were growing like uh, 2x, 3x, 5x. And there were businesses which were absolutely stopped and not uh, moving. We were uh, such all consulting businesses where clients were, uh, we, our interactions with the clients were not happening at that time virtually uh, or uh, even in uh, person at all. So we uh, did uh, some work, uh, some um, knowledge creation work and we conducted seminars, webinars. And we also conducted some surveys. Uh, based on our surveys and based on our webinars, I think how uh, the whole change of uh, family business dynamics is happening is what I want to share with you. So uh, let's see here what we found in uh, post-pandemic era. The, the businesses were either they were in a very uh, strong position and they were accelerated um, and then there were businesses, they were completely stopped or their growth declined. So we found even we, when we spoke to businesses, they were as down as, down as 40%, 25 to 40% down. Some had to completely change the model. So we are all aware about it. How it helps the families or how it is important for us in the discussion is what I want to uh, take it next. Second issue which came up, it was the uh, inheritance planning. We had never uh, had such a surge in uh, families being very conscious and clear about or say being uh, scared, I should say, if I use a word rightly, then feared and scared about what will happen if something goes wrong. Suddenly, like what we said, then we saw the entire VUCA world we experienced. So there was a lot of discussion and action taken on making of wills, making of um, uh, how they are going to plan the next generation's entry in the business how um, money matters would be sorted out uh, between, amongst family members and uh, especially uh, passing of the property or inheritance. Uh, that was one area. So a lot of wills were uh, prepared and family trusts were prepared during uh, or say after post in post pandemic era. Next generation in business, definitely. Um, we came across several examples where senior generation was not able to go to the factory or office and uh, uh, look into day-to-day -day operations. So uh, next generation took over. Or those who were already working in the business, they ended up having more responsibilities. And in fact, one uh, client um, or say the younger generation told me that ma'am, pandemic or say this whole coronavirus has done absolutely, um, I mean, shattered the world. For me, it is very good. It's a boon because my father was never letting me take decisions. And now I've, um, I'm taking the decisions. So now I'm in the business completely uh, in charge of the business. So I'm sure that this must have happened in other businesses too. One issue which came up was the family conflict. Differences when you stay together for a longer time, say as, as family members and in completely closed environment like uh, lockdown, um, uh, families, uh, in some cases, they were bonding, became stronger, but we also saw the cases where uh, family conflict, uh, where on the differences, they came up on the surface. So this was one area which we realized that um, being in a lockdown and situation, and especially the pressure which was coming from the environment, the family's resilience to take that up and be together was tested. 
digitalization of the businesses. I need not talk about, uh, about it to all of you because you all know that and I'm sure that you have also taken steps if we were not so digitalized, you have taken uh, the steps to do that. But uh, business models have uh, definitely changed because of this uh, uh, digitalization need for uh, going online and doing business virtually and uh, bringing in systems and processes which are digital. So our post-pandemic survey through all these points and that made us think that how uh, can we address, not that we do not know how to address it, we are already doing it. Um, as advisors, we are doing it and as companies or say owners also, you are also um, thickly involved in sorting out or balancing your family business ownership dynamics. But somewhere, what could be uh, one answer or a solution which can take care of several issues. And that's where we started thinking we for family governance is something which we all know about it, but we went deeper into it. And then we thought that let's uh, uh, see how this can be made into a, um, a, a proposition for family businesses or the idea for the family businesses that why it is important and why should you look into it immediately if you have not done that. So that was one um, a learning that we had. I, uh, if I um, quickly come to our, um, uh, you know, the next step, or Sam, you all, all of you are familiar, so I don't have to repeat it, but I still would like to bring it to the notice that a family business system, the three circle model, we are all uh, aware about it. You know, it's the there is a family, and then there is a business, and the ownership of the business, so they uh, interlap, overlap, and uh, intersect and uh, very difficult to separate them out. Now, the issue here, or say when we talk about family governance, that means the family members who are a part of the system. These members are the, um, uh, the, the parties or the heroes who are uh, in focus when we talk about the governance of the family. And uh, when we talk about corporate governance, obviously business is in the focus ownership also, promoters also are there as on, or strobe light is on them. But when we talk about family business uh, and uh, ownership systems, then these are the seven positions which we are familiar. If we look at it, uh, uh, the whole event of uh, pandemic and now that we are stabilized and we are be becoming much better or say we are more growth oriented in terms of our economy and our businesses and of course the challenges of uh, growth economy as well. Um, let's look at it that these seven uh, positions or say people or the family members who are there in the seven positions, what has happened to them? or what would be their thought process? Is there any change uh, of the thought process of the family members who are not working in the business and who are not the owners? Let me give you an example of all mothers and wives. Uh, one uh, uh, thing which you, will, you would agree with me that there is a, uh, the fear of pandemic has made us all think about that let's plan our future. Future in terms of money, which are in terms of our wealth, which are in terms of our relationships, our social relationships, and overall, what is going to, even if we can't have future or say what's happening around us in our hands, uh, we may not be able to change things drastically, but let's think about it and let's plan out. So a lot of planning has happened, as I said, the inheritance aspect. So the family members uh, have started giving importance to it. So this is... Uh, uh, when I see that in the system, the planning for future is becoming important. The family executives who are owners or who are not owners, their dynamism is also changing. And that dynamism is changing with respect to, I'll specifically say with respect to next generation, the rising generation coming in the business. So their way of looking at the business, their interest or not having an interest in, in the business uh, joining the business or taking forward this family business is a critical issue. I'm not saying that it was not there earlier. This this issue has been there. It's a perennial uh, issue. But the younger generation, after uh, the change that has come in, um, has become much more, um, I, I would say, much more active, uh, more contributor, uh, contributing more to the businesses because of their 
uh, agile as because of their uh, energy and because of their uh, uh, savvy with uh, digital aspects of the business. You know, they're savvy with the whole online experience and digital uh, things also. So they are, they have become more demanding. If I, if I put it in a, a manner straight way, they become more demanding. They become more clear than uh, what they were in pre-pandemic era about their jobs and about their careers. And that is where the owner families and the, especially the senior generation has to uh, give a serious thought to how the younger generation can be uh, groomed, roped in, or already being there, then what do we need to do in terms of governance? Other uh, uh, aspects of non-executive owners or executives, I'll not be touching a lot because business-related areas, we can have another discussion. But today, uh, specifically on the family aspects, if I see the seventh position where all of you are a part of, or say you you form the seventh position where you are a family member, you are an executive, you are an owner. So there your whole uh, work or say your thinking and your challenge is to see now that how these three circles, which are so entwined, we can't, it's very difficult to remove them. But can we draw sensible boundaries? Can we draw some uh, lines around that or can we take them up as specific areas and uh, rather than overlapping and um, uh, friction oriented areas can we manage these uh, three aspects of our family business in a manner where um, the friction is much less or managed or balanced so this is going to be um, the onus is going to be on you as the family executive and owners to see that how uh, these three dynamics are balanced in a, a practical and sensible manner. So how do we do that? And how do we address these prominent challenges in front of us? I'm not um, uh, uh, talking about any challenges which are very new or which are you, we are not known about. But definitely we have these challenges. All the families have uh, these challenges, either all of them and plus more or some of them or a few of them, but they are there. So so I, I, I think looking at these challenges, we need to um, find out the solutions, some way out from these challenges. Now, before even if I uh, talk about these challenges, let me share these issues, uh, which are, uh, I'm say uh, in, in our practical life or say on day-to-day uh, -day working, we are finding, or I am specifically when <laughs> interacting with uh, two generations, aspirations of family executives. I call family or executives those who are working and drawing salary from the family or getting money paid uh, uh, from the business. So they are executives, whatever level you may be managing director or you may be a trainee, but family executives. Aligning aspirations of family executives. This one case in which I uh, was uh, uh, completely, I realized uh, that uh, this the issue is critical. What is it? The father is running a business for last 24 hours in an education, computer education. The son studied abroad, came back and uh, worked with father for a few months and realized or say maybe uh, he, he just felt that this is not the right way of uh, doing the business. So he told father that you give me the entire uh, um, uh, decision on uh, decision making in my hands and I will turn around the business, which is a very uh, structure or say typical uh, business of computer education. So we will get some franchise, we'll get uh, some tie-ups and uh, we'll uh, uh, take the business. I will take the business forward because what you have done in so many years is something hardly, I mean, it's just paying our bills and you have not made it big. I want to make it big. So the aspiration of the younger generation son is to make the business big. Father's experience of 24, 25 years and says, I know what is right and what is wrong. So I can't let you uh, do the business. So there is a clash of aspirations. There is a clash, clash of motive. Now, the, such motives are, the cl such clashes are there all around us and in our own families and our businesses. So is there a way that we can uh, make these aspirations come together some aspirations which are completely uh, opposite of each other and we just can't manage. Then can we come to some understanding where our aspirations or our ambitions can match and uh, we can create some 
model where uh, we are happy as younger generation and senior generation managing the business. So this is one aligning aspirations is one uh, um, issue which I have I'm coming across much more than I used to uh, uh, come across when I work with families or still working with families. So expectations and emotions of family members, we all know that they are going to be different. What we need is that we can't bring them all together as one, but what we need to do is the balance, bring in the balance. All of these issues and even financial security and welfare of the family, all boils down to one thing where all the promoters tell us um, that let's professionalize our business culture. If we can professionalize our business culture, then a uh, lot of issues will fall in place and we'll be able to um, manage the business and uh, do it better. Now here I want to touch upon this professionalizing the family business or corporate governance very briefly and uh, 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 tell you about this. You know, managing a business or governing a business is uh, is about uh, it's it's about how the business is run that you need to keep a check on. It's not uh, governance is not just doing yourself all all the things, but getting right people, right structures, right um, processes, so that the whole machinery works uh, in a uh, sensible manner, productive manner, and uh, then it is um, and then. You as the promoter, you as the owner could look at um, overseeing it and bring in new ideas or new innovations to grow your business. Well, this is what is easy said than done. Most of us, most of us as, uh, as promoters, owner promoters, we are so much involved in managing our business, doing all micro things that the governance or say, creating structures or making decisions like a board would make and a formal board of a listed company would make is, is something that we are not able to do. it, And that is where this governance, the concept of governance is to see that how the things are running in right manner. And to do that, you got to know, of course, how what are the things and what is the right way of managing the things. But at the same time, one has to also have uh, learned the skills of um, putting oneself away from day-to-day -day activities and focusing on what is, uh, or say it's it's like the, the, the they call it as a, a aeroplane view, you know, birds, birds eye view. So from a 30,000 feet, how from an aeroplane, what do you see the whole business? Well, the promoters, managers don't have to have such a, a tall 30,000 feet experience, but still um, a skill to look at the business in a dispassionate manner, in an objective manner is something uh, uh, is to be learned or needs to be imbibed when uh, we want to bring in the governance, the culture of governance in the business. But this is about um, corporate governance. Let's come to our family. What happens when we are, uh, as a family, we are uh, uh, together as a family, we have differences. As a family, maybe we want to break up in terms of our businesses and so there's a lot of conflict and we say no nothing doing we don't want to work together there are several scenarios and in these scenarios uh, when we talk about governance what does it mean why should we have it that is the core question so we all know that governance will do some magic for us and it will bring systems it will bring processes we'll become professionalized we'll sort out our family's uh, issues and uh, all debates that's happening but it's much more than what we just want to manage the family or family in the business. So governance is, of course, no doubt, it's kind of system structure. But I would, uh, uh, I would before we go to that systems and structure, I think it's very important for us to identify the purpose of governance. And the purpose of governance varies. It varies from company, size of the company, uh, not business so much, but definitely the size or the turnover, the profitability and the growth prospect of the companies and the family, size of the family, generations of the family. Let me, let me categorize the business as uh, in, in three segments. There is a small family who's owning the business, managing the business. When I say small, 
that means there can be an entrepreneur or there are two persons in the family, then only you call them as a family business, uh, three persons, at the most four. Four individuals working in the business and the business is mid-sized business in some crores, but less than 200 crore business. I would put them in a small family, small business category. Let's, uh, for, 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 for the timing. It could be a mid-sized business, but small business, small bit. They have some governance requirement. There is a business or say there is a family where there are more than four members. Or in fact, I would say four plus members, four, five, six, seven, 13, 18 members who are all connected and have got some thing to take back from the business. May not be, they may not be all working in the business, but they definitely are paid something from the business as, as part of the dividends or ownership or salary or larger family and uh, uh, larger involvement in the business. There can be multiple companies. So larger family and multiple companies. There can be another model. And usually we have got the model where there's a small family and a couple of companies, two companies, three companies, for various reasons, the companies or say the structures are made, uh, company structures. So these are small uh, family and multiple businesses. Each three model or each three structure has got different requirement of governance. Let me give you one example right away, because when I'm going to talk about, uh, take you through governance, family governance uh, systems or processes, your, uh, your own identification of your business and your family will become an important aspect here. A small family of two persons, three persons taking decisions in the business and um, single business, managing single business, the complexities are minimal of managing the business compared to the families where there are multiple businesses. When the complexities are limited, the whole culture of governance is driven by the owners, the promoters, the family in the organization, in the family, and it is a, in a manageable manner. Now, when you say manageable manner, what does it mean? So I would say that there are some systems, processes, policies you make it, and the whole environment can be uh, professional in a can become professional in a shorter time and not very deep drastic efforts but the moment we talk about multiple businesses cross holding of businesses cross holding of your shares and uh, e equity and uh, assets and the larger size of the business in terms of people working employees working profitability turnover if that is larger, then the whole family governance takes a different angle. That's where the family needs to look at their own uh, competencies, own skills, and marry it with, merge it with the non-family members' competencies and skills. So the outsiders need to be bringing, to, outsiders are required in the businesses at that level. For multi-businesses, multi multi-generational or very large conglomerates, we'll, I will not discuss that here because that will be a very different topic of family governance uh, if we talk about the large corporates. But let's focus on these two types of businesses, a small business or a larger size of the, oh, sorry, small uh, family, larger size of the family, single business and multiple business and how the family governance challenges will emerge. So let's go to our uh, issue here. What is the purpose of family governance? Let's let's take a um, poll, and and I would I would request all of you to read this and absorb these points. Not that we are going to right away do any family governance uh, system or the other questions, the thoughts which are coming in your mind. I would say just for a moment, uh, put them on hold and read this. Are you uh, uh, okay or say, are you aware about your family strengths clearly? When I say you, I would say the whole family. Is the family clear about the strengths? Does the family want to build a legacy? There are many businesses. Of course, I know that in Mtoy there are businesses which are three, four, five generations old. Few businesses are as old as a four and five generations. 
So they already build a legacy. But the businesses which are there in the first generation and second generation, do you think that your business would have a legacy uh, part? When we say legacy, I would simply, I would say continuity. Continuity and respect in the industry and in, uh, in the business. So one purpose could be that, yes, we want to uh, continue our business to the next generation, to the next to next generation, build a legacy of our name, what we have been doing for all these years with our uh, clients or our services. We may want to grow our business. There are some strengths that we have. For example, we are very good in um, production, manufacturing or supply chain, but we are not great in consumer products, working on consumer products or retail business or B2C business. So what are our strengths? That's one understanding of the strengths. It gives you an idea that what should be our family governance uh, can lead to. So I'm putting these purposes here. Not all the purposes are applicable, but most of them, yes, they are there. The family who's thinking of having a culture of governance, a culture of systems, a culture of transparency, a culture of trust. So to have such a culture, these are the points that we need to understand. So bonding and harmony among family and family branches. Many times I hear from family members that, oh, we have got excellent relationship. We all go together on a picnic and we do spend a lot of time together and things. But some points I've seen surprises coming when I interact with families and on one-on-one -on -one basis that one uh, person or say one brother would say, I want to exit the business, but I am not able to because we are so entwined and my father will not allow me to exit the business. I can't get along with my father, brother. So your bonding and harmony among family and family branches, that means cousins or so, if they are connected in the business, that's important aspect issue to be looked at for family governance. Family governance helps improve this bonding and harmony. Another part is definitely family governance helps is to anticipate, to think through the future, current and future potential and the risks of the business. Whether our business has got chances of going through for generations to generations or our business has got it's good for this generation. Let's think of exiting the business, merger, acquisition and get um, uh, monetize the business or we can continue it for at least another few generations. So anticipating and planning the risk related to business longevity is something where the family governance helps you address. Another part when uh, I uh, interact with uh, families and all of you also understand how do you transfer value to your next generation? Your family values of uh, certain do's and don'ts. Simple, uh, uh, simply, uh, if I give you an example, which all of you would have seen it or somewhere you would be familiar with is uh, Jain families who are in the business of, uh, uh, who are Jains and then religiously their uh, uh, religion is a part of their values, uh, strong values. So they uh, would not want their children to do any business of uh, non-vegetarian food items or leather items. But the shift is happening. The younger generation is looking at the business not from uh, the cultural or religious aspects. They're looking at it from business, from monetizing aspects. And they would want to get into such a business. Now, one may say that have we transferred our values or have we not transferred our values? Or does it, this, this kind of situation, this has it got anything to do with the values? Well, family governance answers you these, uh, gives you answers to these questions. That your younger generation would like to get into a philanthropy activity or um, work for some social cause. And you may say that, no, 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 we are uh, a hardcore business owners and businessmen and we need to continue with the business. So some values are transferred to the next generation some values to change, which have got environmental impact uh, by being their schooling, by, by their neighbors or peers and school friends and teachers, all these influencing factors, they shape their values of the younger generation. Family governance helps to keep a tab and tie and tie up and um, uh, helps, helps the families to see that 
this whole uh, interaction on on values or on, on on what we stand for as a family that becomes stronger in family uh, members well being sustainability and uh, money matters wealth aspect of the business uh, investments are aspect of the business the financial uh, stability and beyond that is something that is answered by family governance and ultimately i would see that all the businesses who are there in the third and fourth generation the promoters know that it is not just that doing business and earning money and earning name or fame but it is a stewardship we are the uh, caretakers of the business we are the um, our uh, next generation will also be there our society is responsible for uh, bringing us to the level that we are successfully what we are uh, doing is a big part of uh, society in uh, my success so then uh, stewardship or say the sense of uh, not just giving back but sense of for uh, being the trustee and the caretaker of the business that develops and all the family members i am sure that when there are larger family members and i have seen cases where a lot of conflict happens in the value of being uh, in the values of giving back or uh, stewardship of the business some family members would not agree and accept that no we are we, we do the business and we put in all hard work so we must get all the goodies and this is the thought process why should are we bother about environment why should we bother about society so these are the issues they come up and uh, family governance helps us uh, find answers for that every family finds its own answers so it's not that um my answer will be same as yours or yours will be same as uh, somebody else's but the important is to find answers now we move from this purpose of family governance to components of family uh, components of governance i'm sure that you are familiar with this uh, 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 structures or settings may not you may not be using all of them in your business but there may be definitely board of directors ceo or management team which which manages the business as a system so if for a smaller business and a smaller family a board of directors and ceos and management team is all made up of family members and a few external uh, outsiders so that's how uh, the whole governance of a family uh, business system takes a different shape another part is your ownership system making of a trust inheritance passing on shares from one to another generation if there are cousins then what happens to uh, passing off of the shares if one wants to exit the business what would happen so there are several examples the large companies examples for example hero group giles so one of the brothers two two sons and uh, uh, both had uh, equal amount of shares and when one son suddenly died or say he died and the, his entire share uh, uh, shares went to equity went to the other brother now he started he he was completely or say rather i should say he is uh, in a totally um, a mode where this is my business i do whatever i want to do even if there are new ideas new things happening one of the family members i'm talking or say not family members but the family branch i'm talking about of hero group now here there could be the thoughts are going on in the family that there could be some way that before passing on all the shares to the other brother and making him the sole inheritor could that be a way that we sell off the shares to an outsider party should there be a way that we can have uh, uh, some diluted equity share given to him or some family members can be given the shares and not make him the whole and sole of uh, uh, of the ownership so there are ownership issues uh, happen whether your several companies are there should you be putting under a trust or say holding company or um, uh, separate them out it's completely uh, two or three different entities these are the issues which are which are part of the family governance system when you, when you develop the family constitution or so so let me come to that quickly uh, family system constitution council meeting that will uh, uh, look into it so family constitution today everybody i think knows about it and there are a lot of conceptions and misconceptions also this is purely i would say a western model a western structure uh, i uh, was uh, uh, quite i would say personally i was not very much uh, keen to you know give importance to this family constitution about 7 8 years ago when i learned about it 
and uh, i thought that no our indian culture in our indian uh, joint family system this doesn't work somehow i'm saying that uh, this constitution if it is designed in in a our indian context in our cultural context then it's a very good instrument it's it's an it's a very effective instrument to, for a family to rely on it may be that you make a constitution and components of constitution we quickly will see this but the issue here is that you the making of a family constitution which uh, where lawyers and chartered accountants come before that there is one um, say part a of the constitution and i want to talk to you about this part a of the constitution which is applicable to small businesses and small families large businesses and small families or larger families and larger businesses all the three models but the part a of the constitution can be very very our own culture indianized part of it and part 2 of the constitution takes care of lot of legalities and uh, financial aspects which were um, some western elements or taxation elements and wealth elements they uh, come in so at a glance let me talk tell you about this document family constitution when we make the family constitution and i saw that family constitution when uh, as a total process is is a process of 2 years 3 years process it involves a lot of learning lot of education for family members and key employees who are uh, associated with the family in the business they need to go through lot of activities it's a major mega project but what do we do as if not this major project or say a mega um, super mega project can we convert it or say can we make it into shape it into our own um, comfort convenience and effectiveness so here are some issues which i have put it which we all can as indian family businesses can look into and define and work on it so family's vision mission values and let me also tell you all these points which i have put it here they are known i am not saying that these are something unique but each point takes a lot of discussion and lot of understanding and um, and and collective discussions of the families so when um, when i work with the families and we have to make constitutions not that we just jump into all these activities there is lot of uh, discussions with family members individual confident confidential discussions that happen and you understand that what are the expectations aspirations of family members so when i spoke about as expectations and aspirations of family members in my earlier slides or earlier part uh, they are directly connected with the family constitution here so these are um, uh, the pointers which uh, are uh, defined or at least if wherever there are question marks even with question marks also the family needs to uh, put them write them down on paper simple paper right now what do we want to have or what if we want to exit the business or what does one person want to exit the business what are the options with us of course this is a guided process i wouldn't say that uh, just whether family members sitting together can do it but this is uh, uh, the process it requires uh, intervention and uh, uh, hand holding uh, from outsiders um this is a com now i will uh, uh, when i spoke about or say when i put it here the constitution here are some examples of policies look at this policies or say examples of policy if i ask you and say that look at all these pointers which are put uh, points which are put up here how many of you would have all these policies in place and some more in place how many of you would have some of the policies in place and how many of you would have no policies in place uh, i mean at this moment we can't do a poll but whenever i have discussed with families i have uh, come across only um, the answer some of them yes but many policies we are not able to discuss we are not able to touch upon sensitive issues and that's why they are not look at this uh, uh, your personal business social expenses mostly they are all in our family businesses they are cluttered unless you already uh, gone into business uh, governance process so these are the points which i am putting to you and uh, very uh, quickly uh, these are all the points which i we can't just uh, touch upon i'll take uh, in question answer sessions when you have points here but my idea is to show you showcase you 
these are the pointers or the thoughts that you need to uh, delve upon or discuss with the family members before deciding any family governance aspect. Very important, whether you go for a constitution or not, but these are the uh, issues which need to be clear. Family governance structures come as assembly, council, committees, board, advisory board. These are purely, I would say, a Western concept. In our concept, yes, for large families have done this. Uh, in some cases, it's successful. In some cases, it's not. For example, Godrej family has got a family constitution absolutely in place legally, financially, and by all means. But still, they had disputes because the promoters had some different ideas. Some uh, last year or so, that was the case. And several families have uh, Cyril um, Mangaldas, uh, um, uh, um, Cyril Shroff family. They themselves lawyers and they themselves are into uh, family governance, drafting of constitutions. But they also face these challenges of having the structure, but not being implemented. So my point is, and my last point here is to all of you is that there is a 10.8. Your family governance and family constitution, if you want to make it, these are the 10 points. Under these 10 points, there could be, there will be some, there are sub points, uh, some more points which would come, some points would overlap, but still these are the issues where you as the owner promoter of a business owner or the promoter of a family business and your family members, you need to consider these points as extremely um, important or say aspects of the of governance and of professionalism. If these points are in place for a family, then I would say and and if you're if you have developed and you're implementing this uh, entire process, which as I said, it's a longer process. Um, but doing it, then your family is bound to be clear about their long-term sustainability. They're clear about what you can do, what you cannot do. And they're you're clear about your uh, transparency and trust. I call them as T factor. The T factor in the family business of trust and transparency, absolutely uh, uh, in place. So I uh, have in... Uh, my uh, yeah i would like to close my session and i would like to have your interaction or say questions from you that if uh, family is about trust and transparency then governance is to nurture and practice that and then there are ways and methods of doing it so i would uh, uh, request all of you uh, this is what we do but yeah this uh, my uh, thank you for uh, giving me the time and uh, I think now we can have the floor open for uh, question and answers. Nita, if you can stop sharing, we will have a larger screen. Yeah, yeah, I will. Thank you. Yeah, good. Yes. Yeah, I think. So I gave uh, a glimpse. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, uh, Doctor Dixit. No, I said I just gave a glimpse of this family governance and family constitution, uh, of course. But then we can uh, have uh, more interaction and uh, question answers. So I guess uh, people are still under thought mode. What questions they should ask? Uh, we only have one question of Mr. Abzal Marabawala. That uh, it's been seen that uh, you know brothers are together for many years, but as soon as the second generation comes in, or maybe third generation comes in, a younger generation, there is always a tiff in the family, or whatever uh, new ideas they have, uh, difference or opinion they have. Right. So I uh, would um, say here, or say in this case, or otherwise. When I am defining or uh, having this business as a small businesses, which are not attractive, lucrative to younger generation, they don't find glamour value in these businesses, then they tend to go away. That is one reason. And another reason is that if since younger, since, since young age, if there is an affinity for the businesses developed, then there are uh, large chances of younger generation coming or say staying in the business. Now, if both the cases have not happened and the younger generation is, say, for, for example, goes abroad, and I'm sure that all of you, or say many of you have experienced this, 
younger generation goes abroad for studies, comes back from a very different environment, very clean and neat and straightforward and communication and transparent environment. And when they see that our business, what the seniors are running, is something which is not suiting. It's not suiting my ambitions. It's not suiting my uh, um, aspirations. So then they do not want to join. So I, I suggest that uh, there is not uh, just one formula for, uh, uh, to solve this problem, but one important issue is that younger generations, what are their aspirations? First, check that out. And now father asking, on, uh, let me tell you also, <laughs> father or mother asking, what do you want to do, beta? Uh, beta has got very different ideas um, of doing things which uh, uh, parents may or may not like it. Let there be a third party intervention to see that what does the beta or betty likes. We do not do that. We assume that our younger generation does not want to join because of A, B, C reasons. What are these A, B, C reasons? When I interact with younger generations, I come up with so they come up with so many points, and I realize that yes, it is not uh, their choice of different career is absolutely correct. So my suggestion here is that you, your younger generation does not want to join. So retrospect, I need to see that whether the whole business is structured in a manner that would um, make them um, uh, happy to join the business or they've got very different education and skills than the business or they have uh, some perceptions about the business and they don't want to join the business just because they think that this business, I don't have a free hand or I will not get uh, decision-making authority or so. So this requires little intervention and uh, uh, with the help of an outsider or say third party, neutral Nita, party. The, observe, the Nita observes question is quite different. What, no, this is what I, okay. Yeah, yeah. What observes, say no, two so generations I, I, don't want to. What he has asked uh, because he has given a rejoinder also. Yeah, okay. yeah. What Abzal has asked is a real life situation. Uh -huh. is, uh, see, the first generation is founder's generation. Second generation is you have siblings. And third generation, you have cousins in business. So uh -huh. you have issues of relationship of cousins with each other, brothers with each other, father, son, and then you have nephew and uncle relationship. So he is talking about the family getting spread wider huh. and it is only natural that hmm. brothers accommodate each other a lot more than yes. cousins can accommodate each other particularly when they stay in a separate home we don't stay under one roof we have not grown under one roof we have been brought up under different roof as a different family so that is his question so the question is what I'm still not getting here. But is, is, is he putting so his cat? question so is he, huh. cousins and uncle and nephew, how can they get along together better? Huh. Up okay. to brothers. Well, he's see, I have seen brothers' rivalry is also intense, not that, but it is quite understandable that cousin rivalries and uncle and son rivalry or differences can be uh, less accommodative to each other. Yes. So how to deal with it is his question. Yes. When it comes to the third generation, this is typically third generation issue, Absolutely. not the second generation issue. Yes. Yes. And the situation comes only when business is good enough and business is attractive enough or perhaps if not attractive, the best option for the third generation to join. They have nothing else better to do. And they join the family business. So his question is about, and that's typically what the uh, shareholder agreement and family agreement is about. So he wanted some ideas on that. Okay. Okay. Now I'm getting the perspective because I could not see it here. Anyway. So I uh, one uh, uh, let's let's look at it the larger family as you said you know multi generational families two three uh, third generation cousins generation now 
most important point is that is your business large enough to accommodate everybody, family member in some position that they would like to play the roles? Um, or is it a kind of a disguised unemployment? The family members, they come and they join or it becomes an employee exchange. You know, it's a family says that our value is we have everybody who wants to work in the business, they can work. So what is that? First important aspect is that whether the business can take uh, the load or does business require family, all these family members who are working in the business. That is number one. Number two, uh, so this needs to be checked and this happens a process or say rather this is very important issue in a, a family constitution. Entry of a younger generation in the business. How do you plan and at what level and who will be uh, allowed to enter the business is something that you discuss and put it in the constitution or family policies, not the constitution, but family policy. Now, the relationship part, uncle and nephew. Uncle and nephew or uh, uh, cousins, third generation, so having different, uh, uh, not, not very close as, as siblings would be or uh, first or say second generation. Uh, I, I think it is again the culture of the family. Is the family providing uh, enough communication opportunities for family members to come together and talk or not? So if that is not so, if that is not happening in the business, then it's absolutely important to, um, uh, to build it or rebuild it in terms of communication. I, I think it is for any family and uh, a relationship aspect and communication aspect in the family is again, um, it's, it's each family has got its biometrics, you know, your own culture and your own uh, fingerprints. So you need to develop that and that can happen. If already the relationship is not working bad, try to make it, uh, separate it out. You know, it's said that, Wafsana jise anjam tak lana na ho mumkin, use ek khub surat mood dekar chodna acha. So in your shareholder agreement or in your business also, See that if it is not possible to be together or work for a longer time together, then legal separation of the business is, is what you need to think. So, you know, if I... Uh, My give... sub question for that would be, Nita, uh, while we consider family constitution as something more Western than Indian, when you go into third and fourth generation and yes. people still are unwilling to quit their or sell their shares, they want to stay put and they probably also want to be in business, will not be the family constitution become more relevant then? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Barkamkar, what you said is absolutely correct. Rather, I would say that going to third and fourth generation as a family and if you are not done the constitution by now, by, by the second generation itself, then you are late already late because you have not set up standards, norms of behavior, norms of doing things, what is right, what is wrong for our family and what is right and wrong for the business. If you have not set up those uh, uh, norms or policies right in the by the time second generation comes in, third and fourth are much late. But even if it is late, I would say better late than never. You have to do it. You need to um, uh, do this uh, uh, do's and don'ts in the family very clearly spelled out has to be done. And many times it so happens, I would add one point here, the large families, rich families, and when I say rich, that means ultra uh, high net worth families, their family constitution uh, does not even uh, work or is not much effective when there are too, already too many family members, they are working and they're at different levels of understanding. And then you make a constitution uh, the effectiveness of that constitution is, is not much. It's very difficult. Like I would give an example of the client where I visited in Lahore and uh, the, the, the third generation of uh, eight members, they developed the constitution, did the constitution, signed the constitution with all the policies in place, set up a family office and they started having more conflict than they ever uh, had before the constitution. Now, when we went into the details and said that why it is so, then I must tell you that drafting of a constitution and which I work or say work with and uh, interact with a lot of lawyers and 
companies. Drafting of a constitution is not something that uh, is just a, a paper pen exercise. Mm -hmm. It means understanding emotions of family members, understanding likes and dislikes, understanding that past history, baggages that they carry. All that, understand that and then draft the constitution. So your third and fourth generation by that time, if the family has not drawn out their policies, then I think it's late. Hmm. But mostly I would say that by at least some policies are in place. Otherwise, you would not continue in the third generation. You see, so, so somewhere some policies are there which are um, for the family members. Well, uh, can I yeah. give an example of drafting of family governance? My friend from Harvard Business School is a Pakistani. Yes. Huh. And he is an automobile manufacturer, banker, mutual fund. Hmm. So ultra high net worth and highly respected. What the group Patria did and third generation had not yet joined the business, but about to join and some were kids. So what he did, he brought entire Harvard family business team to Pakistan, paid for that. And he was as it is on the board of Harvard Business School. So he was, he is ultra high worth and visionary, I would say. What they had is a week long interaction with entire family, right from kids to the oldest person. So family constitution is a rigorous exercise and not something or someone else can do. And one of the interesting thing that came out of his family constitution was very amazing. My friend was the eldest of the family who was a binding force in the family. Second was very good in business. And third was good in the social interactions, government interactions as a face to the rest of the world. So the way they structured family is the elder didn't become head of the business. The CEO became the number two. The elder one who is my friend became the head of the family, family wealth, family matters, all these decisions he became held. Whereas for rest of the society, the youngest was the actual owner and the driving force. When he wasn't, it was the second who was driving. And then the next generation questioned that, dad, you are the eldest. Why number two is head? And then they explained them in public that this is the best for family. I'm good in family matters. I will take care of it. He is good in public interaction, he will take care of it. And I am still better in uh, the number two is better in business. So he is the CEO. So that level of thinking has to go. Yes. And yeah. still the rider is, it is valid only for some period. Things change, equations change. So even these governance rules are timed, you will have to say that we have to review after a particular period and agree again, because if you cast in stone, it won't be valid after a few years. Everything you say is like our business models. They are valid only for a particular period. Beyond that, those are not valid. So I think this is where family constitution would play a very important role. I, I would definitely, and I think I would also uh, um, uh, add here one point, Mr. Bhatkamgar, and for other um, attendees also. Uh, see, in family, constitution is a huge, big process, which I say, and I tell mostly companies or say families that you don't have to go through this huge, big process unless you have got uh, some very large net worth of business or uh, complications or so. But very important is to draw out family policies. Now, we saw it in one case where the family members had many policies we drew out. But one thing which family members decided they themselves and agreed upon is that we will work from Monday to Friday, full day in the office or whatever in our business. Saturday, Sunday, we will not work in the business. So we will not take any uh, tours or any unless it is very urgent. But we'll structure our uh, whole working so that we work from morning 9 to 5 or 10 to 6 in the business. And just this one decision that they took, their entire environment, especially the younger generation coming to office at 12 o'clock, working till 8 o'clock and all that changed. 
the discipline which they got into um, of working hours uh, gave them a lot of free time than what they used to not have it. So I think it's, these are some, some small, small nuances, but they make a big um, impact, create a big impact on <coughs> family and the performance of the business. Ultimately, it is said that if, uh, uh, you know, it's a saying that say, uh, which says that when poverty walks in from the door, happiness flies out from the window. So if the business is not doing well, then family relations and ties and harmony and all are not going to sustain. So your focus has to be on business prosperity and family's well-being comes along with it, but not at the cost of it. So this is very big um, separation that the constitution or the policies can help uh, families um, do that. Now I see a lot of question answers. Earlier I just could not see, you know, there's one thing. So do but you want to still assist you? Uh, uh, Mita, you yeah. focus on your uh, issues and you are... Uh, ask me the questions. And yes. Prashant yeah. will uh, be here to facilitate you uh, with the questions. So right. Prashant, please go ahead. Yeah. So the next question is from Mr. Sharma that he has been, he and his wife has been in the business from last 20 years plus. And a few years ago, his cousins have joined the business and his son studying in USA would shortly join them. So how do they, you know, uh, incorporate any inheritance in the family? So now the cousins have joined the business. So are they stakeholders, shareholders of the business? They no, they are, they, are non, uh, they are non-owner executives. So in that case, uh, I think uh, Mr. Sharma, you uh, your son is not going to join. So your succession plan would uh, rather one succession plan option one would be to interact with your cousins and see whether this succession can happen. Uh, they can be brought in as successors. Uh, how would you do that? Number one. Number one is their um, capabilities, their skills, their performance in the business. And why are they working in your business and nowhere else? That clarity. I'm sure that you would uh, have that clarity. Uh, number two, do you think that their contribution will be, or say, do they will they be able to take it forward when when you pass on the business to them? So, so their skills and their involvement, passion in the business. That is something that you need to work out. So now Mr. comes Sharma, to money sorry. matters, huh? Money sorry, matters, or say. Uh, Mr. Sharma just uh, sent a rejoinder that his son will not join the business. Yeah, son will not join. That's what you said, yeah. no? Yeah, first he had uh, written that he might join, probability of joining the business and now he just sent a rejoinder. Well, I that son has not joined the business, so I'm saying son is not yeah. going to join the business. So obviously the succession plan or uh, moving on or say carrying on the business is something which, which you need to have some uh, identify the successors first from the cousins. If that's not possible, then you can think of some employee. I'm saying this, but it's uh, not very easy because one has to uh, understand uh, each potential successor's uh, capability. There is a bit more no. complexity which he has added, which makes the question very interesting. Okay. So the brother and the son would be not the shareholder owner or something like that. He would join as a non-owner executive, whereas his son, who would be a linear descendant and inherit the shares, doesn't want to join business. I think that complexity is trying to bring here. Yeah. Okay. And his uh, brothers are uh, in business, but as I would say, non-owner executives. executives. Yeah. Okay. And two brothers, not one. Two brothers, they are non-owner. Okay. scenario. Very, very interesting scenario for you to take. Uh, I, I think, you know, well, the way I look at it, uh, the whole scenario here, number one, if you want to pass on your full inheritance to your son and he remains as an investor, he does not be, work in the business, but he remains as an investor, then mm, you your uh, business model has to be absolutely professional in such a manner that sole distrib, uh, uh, ownership is with the son. He sits on the board, but he does not poke his nose if he's not working and he does not come in the picture for decision making uh, at the business level. So he becomes an investor. Let me give you an example of Asian paints. We all know that. So here I can relate uh, partially with this. 
three owners or promoters who started the business and they ran the business. Now in the third generation or maybe fourth, Jalaj Dhani was the last managing director from the family. They have created such a business, the whole model and the structure that where it is uh, owner uh, independent business or people rather, not even owner, people um, independent business, not people dependent business. So any MD also leaves and goes away, the business will not um, go in a very difficult side. independent or person independent? Person, that means people and person. Yeah, okay. Yeah, means one CEO. So the system, one yeah. CEO. Yeah. So it's yeah. not the person independent. Any, even um, in the middle level or senior level, anybody leaves. So the business does not uh, get a big shock. It does not get that impact, uh, negative impact. So it is again very, very highly structured and uh, uh, formalized business model. That's where um, there are only uh, the owner family members are there as non-executive directors, as investors, because they have the larger shareholding. Uh, they don't at all uh, give their uh, opinions on day-to-day -day matters. But they are there, they give their opinion as, as the board members on whether the direction of the business is right, whether the culture is and the values of the companies are met with or that standards are maintained. So, so their um, involvement is at a much larger level, much larger in terms of uh, uh, the organization looking at the organization's legacy. It's not about doing today so much uh, revenue or profitability or loss or so. So if you, your business may not be of Asian paint size, but the point is that if you think that, yes, it is possible to make it a formalized board and bring in outsiders or your cousins to, to manage the business or outsider CEOs, then your son can remain an investor and not. Another model is that you remain a majority shareholder, but pass on some equity to your um, brothers and let them also be the owners, define the norms of ownership, and exit clauses and uh, uh, let them also uh, give their manage the business or give them that right to manage the business. So that could be a natural succession process where your son being the inheritor will keep on getting the dividends. If it's a very small business, then you don't pay even dividends. You know, so the son gets only part of the profit, but, um, but uh, he will not have say in the business. So there are a couple of these two structures which come to my mind immediately. Uh, uh, there could be some more ways also, but I think it would be a good idea to give some part of the equity to your uh, brothers and uh, uh, maybe larger part remains with you and then your sons. There's a lot of otherwise um, uh, conflict of interest will happen. The person who is the largest shareholder and does not have uh, any say in the management will definitely not be an easy thing to do. And it will not be easy for even the uh, board also or the CEO also, you know, that, that you keep on and on getting some uh, directions from the um, investor who is not in the game. His skin is not in the game and he still keeps on giving you some direction, do this and do that. So people who are uh, managing the business will also not be comfortable with that. So I think that you need to really think on uh, this point. Well, I had very similar case, if not exactly similar, while uh, we had taken family business initiative in Maharashtra Chamber and we were also associated with it. Uh, a elderly lady came with her son and they had a good business of 100 crores started by her husband who was no more. And this lady also ran it successfully. In the meantime, they had a lot of brothers and nephews, means sisters, son and uh, cousins and all coming in business. And they started giving shares one after other. And eventually they came that they had a thin majority in the holding and the rest of the family members said, it's because of us, the business is running because we do the sales. Sure. The son said, I am extremely good technically, but I don't take care of accounts and I don't take care of sales. So eventually we took a long dialogue and one thing I asked him to consider is whether instead of giving shares, they can give a commercial salary to an outsider for an accountant or sales and whether giving equity and power is more important for you 
or to pay little more salary and have a complete outsider and in any case what i had suggested them is to have at least two outsiders in accounts and in marketing so that family members don't dominate it completely there will be somebody who is on your side though not from family now your outsider becomes your person and family becomes uh, members become your rival so these are interesting scenarios that develop in family and last they met me they said that they had hired accounts and marketing person at a high salary and now the continuous blackmail they had about more share and more power and more position has been quelled considerably yeah. Yeah. that's 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 a good example yes very good in fact you know i see and i tell promoters whenever you are not, you are drawing some monthly salary without uh, making it a proper structure salary structures and that's a mistake don't do that your balance sheet also will just say that you are because you are owners and you will draw um, every uh, month 2 lakh rupees and 5 lakh rupees for as your salary no make it a proper structured salary norms for family members non family members and uh, with ro- responsibilities and job um, title and responsibilities and role clearly defined that will help because as owners we always had and now it is not so required but in earlier times the taxation times we, uh, we always used to not show much profit in the balance sheet but now the times have changed and we i think it's better to show profit to pay tax and uh, have a clear transparent distribution of uh, income it is not so, not better any longer it is absolutely compulsory there is no choice in digital arena your purchase sales everything is captured you have no choice so prashant i think uh, you can take the next question yeah uh, the next uh, question is a bit uh, very interesting uh, you know even i would like to have an answer for it uh, if uh, we are con- constituting a, you know uh, 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 sorry uh, if a family constitution is created should there be a single executor from the family or should uh, it be more like a board or uh, the external person should also be there on uh, on the you know kind of, uh, what do you call uh, uh, as a consultant or whatever so this is interesting and uh, i must say here that this family constitution when you develop and draft a family constitution so part of it or say in a family how will you implement it you make all the policies family comes together goes on which we take the families on retreat and make policies and draft that but the whole uh, issue is implementation so depending on the size of the family it's not the single executor it is the family council so appoint um, non working members and member uh, working members a combination of that in a council see that you keep an uh, odd number of members in the council otherwise two on this side and two on that side will never help you so execution of family constitution is done through a family council besides family council there can be if the large family say in case of a family we are working there were 13 family members so we created committees one committee was to made up of three persons was only to look after the investments of the families not the family office or big way i'm talking about simple investments mutual funds insurance life insurance policies also so that committee would look into it and give reports to the family council where all the family members would be present in a family meeting not the council but the family meeting and they would quarterly they would share this data so execution of family constitution is done through a family council family council members or say the whole family goes through a lot of learning how to do it um uh, or say training uh, and then there is a business board or say family business board so family business board consists of family members and outsiders and in family business board usually um the ceo or say the outside top management person is there advisor is there and some families have also independent directors in their family business board so they are they are privately held companies but still they have uh, uh, independent directors to uh, uh, be there in the business board so that the board decisions are taken in a very open and uh, judicious manner transparent manner without bringing in family issues in place Because so my answer is a yeah. non executive sorry why should a non family executive have any role in family constitution at all so when 
we are talking about family business board. No, we are talking about family constitution, I think. Yeah, so, family, family council. council. Family council yeah. does not have a outside. See, family council is a body and family yeah. constitution is the document. Correct. Yes. So, why so family constitution is a outside? document. Huh. Yeah, so, it, uh, okay. Uh, how, uh, say, Harvard and other uh, institutes who have worked on this family uh, uh, governance model. So, they number one is you make the document. To use this or say implement this document, number one, you make a family council, select some family members through voting or by some selection method, which they think is appropriate or the consultant uh, suggests. Remaining family members are the family assembly. So when a large family is there and when you have got sisters and brothers and you all want to keep them together, harmony and your values, so then comes a family assembly. Now, in many cases, the families are not very large. So we say it may not be a, don't call it family assembly. It sounds too uh, formal and uh, structured and so too rigid. So instead of that, as a family, as a family, your family, family has got a council. Now, with the, if there are complexities in the family issues and uh, wealth related issues or ownership issues, then make committees, different committees, say philanthropic committee. Some women are very interested, quite interested family members into philanthropy. So they will look into philanthropy aspect of the business. They will suggest what philanthropy actions the family needs to do to the family council. And family council will uh, uh, discuss this down the line with the other members. Now, so family committee, family council, all that happens. You may give some other name also. There are no hard and fast rules also. But when we talk about family business board, that is something more structured and it has got uh, an interaction of uh, outsider and insiders, both family members and non-family members. Because here we are talking about business, we're talking about family and business and we need to um, draw somewhere some lines between families thinking and uh, outsider or say business uh, heads thinking. So family business board many times they may call it as family board, may call it as uh, advisory board, give what it, I mean, name that uh, suits uh, you or you like it. But the idea here is that it's, it's not just the family members working or non working, but some outsider inputs are also. See, now, a, your question I was of. View, I have a view about having odd number of members in any committee. It is okay when a judge has to pass an order and you have a bench of five or three and then majority decision carries because that judge has nothing to do with the people involved in the case and the destiny and fate of what happens later on. Here I would say number one people may abstain so that odd number is not a panacea. Second is uh, when it comes to a vote and if the person chairing cannot drive a consensus, it is a beginning of it. So if you have to go for voting and in our associations, we have never allowed voting wherever I was present. Getting body elected, it's done by outsiders and there is a larger membership. But within a committee, if we have to vote on something really, then that's a beginning of end that we can't work together. So I would say this or also we have to take with pinch of salt. Well, I guess it's a, a, a voting or say odd number is to uh, give your, uh, uh, you know, one casting vote. Suppose if you have two family members, younger generation, two are senior generation and they both are on two different sides, then uh, you but need. Uh, you know, abstain, so, so odd doesn't but, really yeah. add up anything. People can yeah. abstain. They may not attend the meeting. So, or so, uh, 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 Mr. Badkamkar, uh, the most important thing and for all our participants also, I would say most important thing is that first of all, the family needs to get educated about this entire process. First, understand why do you require a family constitution? And I would even start with the question that do you really require a family constitution? And then at what stage you family is, succession is and the growth is. So, I uh, these are all guidelines. If we really see then in our Indian culture and in our Indian traditional culture of doing business or the Lalaji's, a lot of things are already done. 
family policy is very very clearly done or say uh, uh, earmark ki hum ye kar sakte hain ye hum nahi kar sakte hain as a family so the issue here is that whether as you said right odd number or even number but um, i would say it's again depends on the size of the family and the maturity of the family and most important thing is to develop this maturity and understanding of family members the whole process can stop start and stop right there in in the first instance to to when to when to educate or bring in all family members on the common platform there itself the constitution uh, stops and that is where i see you know, in interactions that don't start with very large constitutional ideas and setting up council and code of conduct or so no start in a smaller way defining family policies first learn how to understand uh, get hand holding mentors to see how to use these policies and policies themselves are uh, you know 80% of the work would be done with your policies are drafted clearly especially roles responsibilities of business owners in the business their accountability and their decision power if they are defined clearly or say they are discussed clearly then many issues are sorted out right there and next gen entry or you want to put in money where you want to put in money invest money individuals investment or say i had a client where individual investment were all allowed and uh, they were doing it and one guy who, uh, invested in shares and he made lot of money other brothers did not like it so so these are the issues which you first need to work on at policy level from policies then slowly evolve learn and then make a constitution constitution is important useful very useful as a for document a legal document or so when you have lot of assets or mixed assets or complex structures of business and ownership but at least um, start with making policies i would say yes sir prashant abdul's question i will pose again at least part of it you can okay. take risk i think what abdul has asked is about daughter in law daughter son in law in fact abdul the issue is becoming larger now in many case many families not all but many it is not just uh, son in law joining daughter in law joining now we have separation divorce so the other person so step child coming or uh, step relations coming and step relations successors coming has started happening already and we have seen that so we hope it doesn't happen but one has to think about it so your thoughts on that see yeah. if getting along with cousins is difficult getting along with in laws of my cousin will be lot harder and they come in business now in laws come in business be it daughter in law or son in law and the next generation that follows so your thoughts on it meeta yeah sure so daughter in laws or son in laws joining a business that requires a lot of thinking lot of uh, background work for that um uh, i would say if uh, le let's take example of anuaga thermex company you know anuaga's husband died suddenly at a stage where she was not uh, she was just an employee in the company but she had to take over this listed company's chairpersonship or managing director and ceo she became she lost her son also at a very young age then she is now only one daughter meher uh, forgetting her last name and now daughter and son in law they are running the business in all these cases what they have done and others other families they have structurized business professionalized the business in such a manner that relationships are there no doubt family relationships but the the whole business is run by professional son in law so your uh, when daughter in laws come in the business and here i definitely would uh, tell the senior generation that when daughter in laws or son in laws come in the business and in laws they bring in a new factor in the in your relationships so be positive about it and learn to manage it and learn to accept some changes which daughter in laws or son in laws are going to bring in it, that is the um responsibility i would say is of the senior generation it is not some daughter in law has left her 23 her years of experience and life and all and have come and she is very new now when you have got a we have a child and child is learning to take steps one year two year three year old to say toddler and three year old how much we hold hand and say 
please don't do this or you will fall down or let's walk this way. So we all engaged in teaching the child to take steps, small baby footsteps. How many of us are doing that with the daughter-in-law? We are just, we are not at all taking her through that footsteps that this is our family, these are people, these are our relationships. You get used to, get acquainted to our climate slowly, steadily. Whatever you are uh, bringing in, we will also accept or adopt uh, to that culture to an extent. And then we, um, uh, we, we make it, you know, so bringing a, a daughter-in-law coming to the family and being very open uh, and accepting her and taking her and grooming her, that is a process. That is, that is again on the family part, which I'm saying. But when daughter-in-law is capable and she wants to work in the business and if your family and everywhere, all, all of you are okay with it, then the family policies will allow you to do that or make family policies to allow to do that. The whole issue starts with daughter-in-laws and son-in-laws that daughter-in-laws will never consider, uh, or not never, but she is coming from a very different environment. And here is the environment that requires very soft handling and, uh, and bringing her in and uh, nurturing her. Most of the time, we don't nurture our in son or daughter-in-laws uh, uh, in our uh, business, uh, family culture. We just expect them to adjust to us. So my point here is very especially when I work with a lot of women leaders and I see that there are, and in fact, I would say, put it here, Mr. Bhatkamkar, that we are, I'm doing a research on um, women in family business where we have interacted with two or three women running the business. Sas, Bahu, granddaughter, all of them. I know running at the least two so, founders yeah. who have more faith in daughter-in-law than son. So it is happening and they would Happy. rather trust daughter-in-law to yeah. make the critical decisions. They may still not be CEO, but internal critical decisions, they rely on them. Yes. yes. But in uh, Thermax, the case was different. Huh? Anu's yeah, father was the founder. Yeah, he was the founder. Is, yeah. uh, she was the linear successor. So Anu's father was a founder and son-in-law, Anu's husband became the MD. So that was a son-in-law and the legacy continued. So now so the son-in-law, daughter and daughter is chairperson, I guess, and the son-in-law. So both the generations, the son-in-laws have uh, uh, worked in the business. But of course, it's a different league of uh, business and a company, I would say. Here, I would say that any son-in-law, daughter-in-law coming to our business, we must have empathy and understanding to accept them and groom them in our culture. It requires patience. It requires a lot of you know, chief emotional officer, they call CEO. So women of the family need to play that role. So we will be concluding on time, Prashant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we just exceeded about three minutes, but that's okay. It was an interesting topic and uh, discussion. So I think, uh, thank you everyone for joining. I now hand over uh, uh, to Mr. Zaksas Master, our president to uh, conclude it. Thank you, uh, Dr. Meeta Dixit for a very, very invigorating session. A lot of food for thought for us family businesses. As uh, our past IPP, Mr. Shantanu Bhatkamkar said, 95% of our memberships are family-owned businesses. And in the world, we have seen some of the finest institutions and uh, businesses being run by or started by the family. Of course, it comes with its own challenges, and especially family governance today plays a very big role. Uh, the pandemic, as you rightly said, changed the dynamics of the business considerably. And uh, a lot of the drawing boards were redrawn, as, they, as you can say. Uh, and it is time that the family businesses became professional and there is proper governance, as you said. It can be written or unwritten. I know of a very big family conglomerate in our own industry where I have had discussions with them where nothing is written, but everything is understood. And it has run very successfully over the last few years, uh, over, over 70, 80 years. Uh, there is also a question of carrying on the family legacy. The new guard has a difference of opinion of how to run the show. Uh, new entrants in the family can cause a rift. Uh, I know of a family business also, which is quite large, where 90% of the, where uh, the few brothers are doing all the work and one brother is not doing anything, but is getting equal share. And uh, uh, as my friend's father told him, that is his kar good karma, 
that is his good uh, what you call uh, you know and uh, fortune he's part of the family we have to give it to him and that's how they have maintained the family unity and ensure that relations continue and the business does not split either they are happy that he is not in the family because he business because he could probably cause more damage there so he's kept aside but that's how everyone is you, nothing is in black and white or fair or straight lines you have to curve the lines to make sure that the business runs well and the family remains intact um i, I don't think there is a a, a a fixed formula for this you have to keep talking discussing each family has its own separate dynamics and uh, we have to constantly see which family what their uh, what your constitution is what is the size of the family as you rightly said a very small family business for example like mine does not require a, a, a family constitution uh, that way and um, yes i mean we can we have to keep talking keep discussing and uh, finding ways and means to continue the family legacies the family rules more important than the business is the relation we have seen so many families split apart uh, because and then eventually which results in destruction of the business as well so i think it's a very very serious matter we have to keep discussing keep evaluating uh, one of the most serious concerns is that when the old guard feels that you know everything will just fall into place eventually it does not you have to plan you have to write and life is very uncertain and uh, you brought up some very good examples i know the thermax family very well and uh, they have done a fabulous job with so many setbacks of reconstituting the dynamics of the business and carrying taking it to another level so thank you very much once again i would also like to express my thanks to our ipp mr shantanu batkamkar mr prashant popat and mr tarun sharma for organizing this very interesting talk on a saturday and i hope that our members benefited from it as well so thank you so much i thank you all for giving me this platform to share my experiences and my views on uh, family governance and thank you thank you thank you so much everyone thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. namaste yeah